everyone. My name is Omar Qadri. I'm your host for this show called Secrets of Greatness. First things first, if you haven't already done so, please do click the subscribe button and leave your comments from this episode at the comment section below. Today, I'm so excited to chat with an award-winning entrepreneur, Satish Bala. To help other entrepreneurs break the $1 million mark after the sale of his marketing agency in 2018, Satish launched a boutique CEO coaching incubator called the Bala Group. He works with tech founders on their journey from idea to their first million. Satish, welcome to the show. It's such a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's nice to be back into doing some business, meeting humans and sharing in this crazy time that we live. So I appreciate the opportunity to share. The pleasure is all mine. Let's get right into it, if you don't mind. Yeah, let's do it. So these, let's start off all the way back from your childhood. What do you say, right? Tell me, um, how did your childhood, ex uh, all the experiences that you had in your childhood, how did they shape you in becoming the person that you are today? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it's also probably a three hour session just on that <laughs> one question. Um, you know, I am an immigrant. I was born in India to a very large family. Um, my dad's side, I think was like 12 mm. brothers and sisters. And my mom's side was another 10 or 11 brothers and sisters. So it's a little village, man. And being the first grandson, uh, being a male, there's a lot of pressure um, put on you from the day they know you. You know, my mom was pregnant. I wasn't even born yet. There's already a lot of pressure that this this young man is going to be uh, somebody and he's going to lead the family and all the stuff. And you know, anybody who knows the South Asian culture, for us, academics is really important. Getting the A's and A pluses is really important. Um, and so for me, you can't just uh, do with a B. Yeah, you know. So for me, you know. Uh, the, the, the early days of my childhood were, were very rough because uh, academically, uh, I just never got it. I never understood uh, what we were being taught in class. Um, you know, today, when I look back as an entrepreneur, knowing that the problem you're trying to solve, the journey you want to go on, the person you got to become, those are all books and, and YouTube videos on it. But when you're a little kid and you got these questions on like, who am I? Why am I learning these things? What's the benefit for it? Who would I want to become? And the answer is shut up and just do math hmm. and, and you suck at it. Their ripple effects are not that good, you know, and we hmm. come from a, I'm 45. So I'll come from a time where getting slapped around and things were normal, right? My mom used to say, you know, the harder we kick the ball, the further it goes, but man, to be that ball, that's a tough role to play. Right. Um, and so that was my sort of beginning days, you know, uh, and, and we grew up poor money was always, uh, a topic of conversation uh, as a survival tool, you know, money, 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 money. So, you know, most of my early days, I grew up 100% convinced I'm this dumb, stupid kid who's going to be poor for a really long time, that, that uh, this is a life that I'm meant to have. Uh, and then, you know, over the course of the, the last, I would say, you know, 35 years or so, um, I've really learned how to change that mindset to one of mm. abundance how to dream big, how to think about solving problems and getting paid for it, how to fundamentally believe that all of the things in life uh, that I deserve, I'm able to go get. And this belief system uh, was really sort of honed in through multiple businesses, some that worked, some that didn't, uh, but all of them taught me something about myself. And so for me, um, that's where the sort of the gift of my early days were, were yeah. the struggle, and the abuse and the challenges really forced me to think differently and not quit. Right. So that's very interesting because I work with a lot of um, youth who have similar, who have that similar mindset and that environment where they, ha uh, you know, their environment gets them to believe in certain limitations that I cannot do this. I am not smart. I am not gifted. And that's such a, um, um, you know, um, it's a, it's in a way it's a curse sometimes because, you know, once you are stuck in that mindset, it's really hard to break out of it. How did you break out of that mindset and that environment where, you know, you were told by your teachers um, and, you know, the, your environment that, 
if you're not good at math, Satish, you're, you're probably a dumb kid. <laughs> you know, how did you break out of that? Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, I, I love the power of, of rock bottom. You know, um, when we hit rock bottom, reality sort of kicks in. And some of us that are falling backwards in life, we don't hmm. fall back far enough. We okay. fall back just enough to feel the pain and complain and, 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 and be in that negative mode but you don't give yourself permission to fully fall back where now there's no more bullshit. You're mm. facing the reality of what life is giving you. And then you can start to work positively. So for me, you know, that moment happened when I was 13 years old up to that point, I was like, yeah, okay, I'm a dumb kid, whatever. I'm stupid. You know, dad's going to hit me a couple of times and I'm not the, I'm not the <laughs> smartest kid. And this is what my life is. And then at 13 in Singapore, where I grew up, yeah. um, you have to do a countrywide national test. And the outcome of that test predicts and sort of secures the future in Singapore. At and the age of 13. Good, at the age of 13. Which I didn't know. So I took this test and we get this, you know, uh, report card from the government of a little country that says, hey, Satish did miserable on this test. His scores qualify him to be a blue collar worker. And you know, here's some of the career paths that he can start to consider starting age 14, garbage collector, you know, your, your standard like construction guides and all these things. And I remember looking at that going, man, an entire country, like it's one thing for your family to tell you, oh, you're dumb, you're stupid. An entire country has just sent an official piece of paper to my home saying, this is your future. And I hit rock bottom. And I remember thinking, wow, like if everybody else has already decided the kind of life I want to live, where do I get to choose what kind of life I want to live? And so for me, the answer to your first question is hitting rock bottom allows you to, to, to sort of get realistic about where you are in life, right? And it doesn't mean you have to agree with it, but you got to get realistic about where you are in life. And a year later, we're in Canada. Mm -hmm. My parents moved. They were ashamed of, you know, the results and wanted to protect themselves and me. And we got on a plane. We come to a new country and... All of a sudden now I've got teachers that are saying all the things about me. You know, you're charismatic and you've got great creative ideas and you're a storyteller, you're a gifted speaker, you're an athlete. I'm like, who are we talking about here? <laughs> right? And, oh, and awesome. so when you're empty and you're all the way at the bottom and you're facing the reality of, you know, I want a better life because you can't get any worse, then you, you are open to new ideas and new programming, however inspiration comes to you. Hmm. But when we're in the middle and we're telling ourselves a bullshit story and it's not low enough, you haven't yeah. fallen back enough, your cup is not empty enough to be filled by other moments of inspiration. So for me, I was empty. I was already out. I told myself I want a new life. I was open to receiving inspiration. And I found it at the age of 14 or 15 in Canada. I found people whose words and actions showed me that maybe there's another version of me that is possible. Mm. And if that is the truth where I can now reinvent myself once, well, how many other times can I reinvent myself? And that literally my friend has been my journey of life hacking for the last 30 years. Wow. Last time you and I, Satish, we used and I, we spoke about um, the theory of being knocked down versus knocked out right? Yeah. Is this something related to that? And if you want, if you can, can you share with us that yeah. theory a little bit more? No, hundred percent. So, you know, what happened in my early 15, 17 year old version is now there is a, a version of me that, that feels more natural. Right. Mm. Um, and, and I don't know who that person is yet. Cause you know, if you look at a life of like 17 and yeah. you know, a certain version of you until 14, you're only living this new life for about two to three years going, man, this is interesting. You know, who am I? And one of the things you asked earlier of like, you know, circumstances, how does that impact who you are? Right. And one of the things I try to tell people all the time is, you know, we are the best of the people we surround ourselves with and the environment. I just got lucky that my environment changed completely. Mm. If I was still in Singapore, surrounded by the same negativity, the same teachers, the same classrooms, I wouldn't have been able to change my mindset. So that's one of the first things I tell anybody. If you feel like your current life doesn't make sense, start to change your environment. And it could be as simple as take a different bus to work. 
walk a different path to get home, right? Sign up on an app that you've never been on to just make new friends or go to a random networking event that you would never usually show up for. Change your environment and start to attract new energy. And it's a beautiful, you know, uh, attraction philosophy that is very simple to do. I'll give you another example of how I use that. Please. But uh, when I first started my company, um, it was out of like fear of failing because mm. I've now spent from the age of 13 to 20 trying to prove everybody wrong, right? I'm not that dumb kid. I'm going to go to university. I'm going to do all this stuff. You know, I'm about to graduate and I'm not really interested in getting a job. Uh, and, and I'm like, what do I do? Well, I can start my own company, which I did, but so much of the skills to be an entrepreneur, nobody's taught me. I don't have an uncle who's a business fan. I don't have an aunt who's a businesswoman. Where do I learn those skill sets of meeting people, pitching, closing, being comfortable and speaking and small talk, Yeah. right? Um, so I said, okay, how do I hack this moment? So I decided I'll just go to different networking events every single night. And for 365 days, including my birthday, including Christmas, including holidays, I went to a networking event every single night. Love it. And every single night I had micro objectives. The first two to three months, I just wanted to show up in an uncomfortable place, man. I didn't want to talk. I was nervous. I don't know what to say to people, but I just wanted to be in different places and see different people. So I would go book clubs, you know, speed dating, foodie groups, reading. I don't care if there's more than 10 people in a room. I wanted to be there. Just be used to being around other people and other energies, right? And then I started making milestones. Okay, for the next two months, I have to leave by giving somebody a business card. And then mm. I got comfortable approaching people. And then I have to at least have the confidence to ask for one business card back before I leave. And then it was, how do I get rid of 10? How do I get booked to speak? And by the end of the year, after 365 days of changing my environment, I can walk into any room, make 10 friends, and make sure everybody knew who I was before I left the room. I love that. There are two such key things that you spoke about. And I, I couldn't stress more how important those two things are, Satish. One, put yourself out there in, in very, very uncomfortable zones. If you want to get out of that misery, if you are feeling knocked down and knocked out, you know, get yourself out there and be able to, you know, you spoke about you, the, the uncomfortable thing you did was, was networking. And I think for me as well, surprisingly, when I was on my journey, I, I, was not, I was not that young. I was definitely not 20. When you started at a very young age, 20, I did that when I, when I was 28 years old, right? Wow. And I made this a very similar promise as well when I started uh, doing my own self, uh, self-discovery. And that was, um, I'm going to meet one new person every single day and converse with them and buy them coffee. So I had a pretty, a pretty uh, large uh, Starbucks bill <laughs> by the end. <laughs> but that's one promise that I, I, I made sure, and I still haven't broken that. It's been, what, uh, three and a half years now. And I yeah. still try to meet at least one person every single day, which is, again, to me, meeting with these new people um, doesn't, it, it definitely puts me in a, um, in a growth zone because I get to learn so much faster, right? And I think you did something very similar, which I love. And you did it for like every single day on Christmas, on your birthday. And the second thing, breaking those, um, creating milestones, breaking the big picture into smaller achievable goals. I think that's really important in building uh, new habits, right? Um, and what, when you were doing that, how did you, um, was there a person or what happened in your story afterwards? Like when you started doing that, what changes did you experience? Did you have like this uh, benefactor all of a sudden who came in and, you know, put his uh, hand over your shoulders and be like, come, I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. Like what happened? I wish, that? man, I wish. <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think what I learned, you know, early on in life is unless you understand who you are, unless you have a method for continuously building yourself up, uh, everybody else's opinion will start to matter. Mm. And so, and that's the life I came from for the first 14, 15 years. I didn't know who I was. So everybody else's opinion became my version of myself. So I said, I can't rely on mentorship or advisors or guides or angels or whatever we call them. Because if I don't know who I want to become, 
then their version of me becomes my truth, right? Mm. And the other thing I discovered in my, in my 365 days of, of, of being out there is the things that we care about, the things we love, the things that we don't want to screw up, that's the discomfort zone. Mm. The things that we don't care about, we do it because we don't care. You know, I say the same thing to my friends that are single. If you're looking at a girl, okay, or yeah. a guy, and you have yeah. no interest in that person in a relationship level, you have no fear. You'll walk up and say hi, shoot the shit, buy them a drink, and you walk off because you have no other emotional need from that person. But if you happen to like them and you wanted something more from them, that's when you get nervous. That's when you stutter. That's when you're afraid to go up to them because that's got so much value for you. So for me, I chase feelings of discomfort because in there is something I need to become or, or, or achieve because if I don't have that feeling of discomfort, it's not as important to me anymore. Does mm. that make sense? It's Absolutely. almost opposite to what we tell people, right? Which is, you know, the things that you do naturally go do it. I'm like, that's cool. But the things that you're discomfortable in doing is because you care so much and not failing in those things that you want to avoid them. But those are the things you must do. And that's such a difficult decision for the young folks to make because just putting yourself out there is it's so difficult. Like you're, you're, put, you're making yourself feel vulnerable in those situations. And yeah. I think the, the, re, the reality is that you have to make, you have to become friends with vulnerability at the end of the day. Yeah. You have to be vulnerable in order to grow. And that yeah, is and one of the keys to, you know, ha do what you, what you were able to accomplish in your, yeah. in your journey. And, and listen, whether, whether you live to be 100, 200, 60, your number one relationship is with yourself. Mm -hmm. And almost everything you experience, fear, uh, uh, you know, sadness, happiness, vulnerability, uh, embarrassment, it all happens with you first before the world recognizes it. So if you are going to be in the greatest relationship of your life with yourself, yeah, then it's, it's on you to fully understand why you do the things you do. Right. And I think for me, uh, this life hacking that I've been on, um, it's not perfect. There's mm -hmm. still the imposter syndrome that creeps up every now and then at 45, having sold millions of dollars in business and being on stages and recognized as, a, as an expert in my area. There's still things where I'm like, man, what if people find out I'm not that good at this stuff? You know, the 14 year old, <laughs> that 14 year old version of me creeps up. You know, I still have moments of discomfort, you know, in something new that I'm starting. Like I'm working on publishing my first book and it's full of anxiety. Like, yeah. you know, putting out my story, even though I can talk to you for hours and days about my story, documenting it into a book and putting it out there. I'm completely discomfortable. So kind of like what I did with my 365 project, I run a daily podcast every single day to get better at talking about my life. And That's we're awesome. in episode 40 ish or something. And I get better at every single day, but I attack my inconsistencies and my, my fears and my vulnerabilities. And I attack them to a point where you beat it up enough. That it doesn't exist. You know, and it's the same thing when people look at some other parts of their life, you want to, you want to become healthier. Well, the most hardest part about becoming healthier is the first 12 days mm. where you got to put in the work. Right. And then it becomes easier and easier and easier. The difference is, you know, you want to be healthier, but in mm. so much of what we're talking about, you don't know what the outcome is other than you're working on yourself. There's no defined goal. It's not to say, hey, if you do 365 days of networking, this is going to happen. Yeah. You, ca you can't visualize confidence. You can't visualize an attitude change. You can't visualize internal happiness, right? But that's the parts that we have to work on so that all the other things we want to do becomes second nature. Absolutely. That's so well put because those are the intangibles that we are not taught in school, right? Those are the, we're only taught those uh, um, trig trigonometry Pythagoras theorem, but we are not told how do we yeah. build that confidence? How do we build that ability to tell our stories and be vulnerable and, and develop a more positive mind frame? Um, so, so yeah, and, and there's another quote, uh, which reminded me when you said that, and I love this quote, you can't get out of life alive. At the end of the day, there's no other way to live life than to live it. No matter how hard you try, how conservative 
safe, protected you live, mm-hmm. none of us get out of life alive. So wow. you got to live it. You got to get burnt. You got to get scars. You got to get kicked in the stomach. You got to fall in love. You got to get the heartbreaks. You have to live life. Absolutely. That's so well put. So you spoke a lot about, you know, no, having that relationship with yourself and knowing yourself. Would you say, Satish, that is the crux of it for you, at least in, in your experience? Has that been the secret sauce or the blueprint for success for you? Oh, 100%, man. And I think it's the blueprint for success for everybody. You know, mm-hmm. we talk about this, you know, millionaire mindset, right? Mm-hmm. It's got very little to do with money. Yeah. It's about your mindset that, that, that forces you to ask yourself, what is the problem that I want to solve that is large enough, big enough, important enough that will help me earn this million dollars, mm-hmm. right? Because when you look at, you know, what your purpose is in life, you, you are taught morals at home. You are taught, you know, social skills in school. You're yeah. taught in education in school. What are all those theory things for? Either you're going to take all that and work on your own idea and solve a problem, or you're going to work for somebody who's solving a problem. But at the end of the day, from the day we're born, we're groomed to serve society somehow. Mm. And if that is our ultimate give back, we serve society. And some of us, you know, serve through corporate, some of us through non profit all these other models, you can't serve if you don't know what you got to give. Correct. And so this question of who am I, what makes me who I am, how am I seeing the world, what are my filters, these are things that we, we expect people to do in moments of crises, midlife crisis, oh my gosh, I'm trying to figure myself out. These are fundamental questions you're, you're asking yourself along the journey as you're maturing. So what I call life hacking, I hope, is life for everybody, mm. right? And the more you learn to listen to yourself, the more you get closer to what you want to do, the more impactful you're going to be. And impact, the outcome of impact, the symptom of impact is money. And the more impactful you are, the closer you are to making that million dollars. Right. That is so true. If there is one tool that you would say you want to share with, with the world about how to answer that million dollar question, who am I? How do you go about answering that question? What tool would you suggest? Yeah. And I think, you know, there's versions of that story. You know, Mm -hmm. we believe it's a, it's a answer once and forever done. Right. And that's what I thought. And that's not the case. You know, if you and I met, I'm 45 today. So if you and I met when I was 20, who am I is a software developer out to change the world through coding. 10 years later, who am I? A creative storyteller who wants to infect the world of my ideas and creativity, right? 10 years ago, who am I? The founder of Desi Fives who's on a mission to remove stereotypical thinking and gender bias and age inequality from our South Asian culture. Who am I today? I'm a passionate speaker that wanna empower everybody to find their voices and earn the life that they are capable of. Who am I in 10 years from now? published author, goddamn mayor of Toronto. Absolutely. (laughs) So for me, the idea of of who am I really comes down to what am I trying to accomplish, right? Mm. Um, And that changes based on who you are. You know, if you happen to be at a nine to five job, awesome, your answer could be, I want to be the best contributor to the success of this company, Mm. right? If you are an entrepreneur starting your own company, the answer could be the problem you're trying to solve is, is the most important problem in your life. And nobody solved it to a point yeah. where, you know, you're happy with it. And so, you know, for me, I encourage everybody to say, hey, the answer to who am I starts to what do I want to offer? And, and what do you want to offer mm-hmm. helps us now say, well, how do you want to offer it? Right. I meet so many folks that come into my incubator coaching program as I want to be an entrepreneur. And we realize, no, the path for you is not entrepreneurship, but it's to be a great contributor to somebody else's company, right? So I think that's what I would encourage people to say, hey, you know, ask yourself, like, what do I want to offer the world? And then when you ask it with authenticity, you also learn what are the things you have to work on to be able to do that, right? 
And when you identify, man, like what I did to, for me to build a great company, if I don't have the ability to network and meet people yeah. confidently in a quick 30 second, explain what I can do to them and confidently ask for their, you know, money to help me do that to them. I can never be in business. Mm. So I went out and did it for 365 days. You know what I'm saying? So once you figure out, Hey, what do I want to serve? Yeah. Then you can say, well, what are the gaps I need to fill in to be able to do that better? And then it's, how do I do that by myself or with somebody else or whatever? And that's one of the things we talk about in, in leadership. When you have those two answers, it's easy to attract people to come join you in your mission, right? They're not there for a paycheck. They're not there for a yeah. fancy logo. They're there because, man, this guy, Satish, knows why he's doing it. How is he going to do it? And I believe in that vision, so I want to contribute to his business or his vision or his story. And that's when leadership skills start to be, in, in, you know, sort of develop. And so it's a three-part answer more than a simple, who am I? I am this and go. And unfortunately, the rest of the world tries to get you to answer it with that single question. Who am I? And they want to freeze it in time. And that's your definition. Just like our culture, you know, you graduate as an accountant. You are an accountant for life. God forbid you discover a different passion and now you want to be a teacher or a guitarist or a rock singer. No, 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 no. You are an accountant, bro. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's so, that's so true. It's, it's, it's not a, it's something that's not static at all. So please changing gears a little bit. Tell us your reason behind starting Daisy Fest. Uh, a lot of anger, man, to be honest. Um, uh, I, I grew up knowing I'm South Asian or Indian, but didn't really understand the nuances of the culture. You know, I left mm -hmm. India when I was three. We grew up in, in, in the southern parts of Chennai. So I knew I speak Tamil, but most of my early memories come from Singapore. So in Singapore, you're just another Asian kid. You happen to yeah. be darker than the other Asian kids. We didn't have a lot of, you know, Caucasians or African mm -hmm. Africans in there. And so... For me, I was an Asian. Then I come to Canada and my very first experience, I think day two, half of grade eight, we came in for the second half of grade eight. And I'm in the playground chilling by myself. Um, and these two Indian kids come up to me and like, hey, you're new here. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm Satish. And my last name is Balakrishnan. And they're like, oh, so, so you're Tamil. I'm like, no, I, I speak Tamil, but I'm not Tamil. They're like, but you speak Tamil, so you must be Tamil. And I was like, wait, I'm so confused. Who am I? <laughs> right and that's when i realized man there's like there's a little country called sri lanka and people from there speak tamil but they consider themselves the language tamil and i was like oh so you thought i was sri lankan and then and then i was like i'm a hindu and i, I was so confused for my first five years man what kind of brown i was where i just shut down i was like <laughs> i'm not messing with indian people i'm gonna hang out with my black friends my white friends my asian friends i'm gonna hang out with my trinidadian caribbean friends I'm going to stay as far away from Indians as possible because I don't get it. And then people will be like, wait, you're from India and you don't speak Hindi? I'm like, well, is Hindi the only language in Hindi? In <laughs> India, I speak Tamil. It was so confusing. So, you know, uh, the reason for this backstory is in Canada, while mm -hmm. we celebrate South Asian culture and multiculturalism, you remove the government PR layer underneath we're still so segregated man not mm. just by the language but by the geo you know pakistanis are in mississauga punjabis are in brampton tamil speakers are in scarborough and markham they don't go i'm like what when did we divide the country by like our language now we right? have divided the gta <laughs> you know and so i found all of these layers and uh, this was right when my wife and I were, were uh, expecting our first daughter, 2007. And I remember, and this is after I sold my second company, and I was so troubled because, you know, I married a, a, a Muslim girl and mm -hmm. I'm, I already went through like a battle to get married, right? So oh, like, wow. man, we have this mixed culture imagine. already. Uh, <laughs> and, and now we have a baby girl coming into this, this world. Is she Muslim? Is she Hindu? Who does she grow up with? What's multicultural look like? Which event do we go to? Because if I take it to a, to a Pakistani event and I'm Hindu and I don't, you know, I don't fit in. If I take it to an Indian event. So I was so confused and I wanted a way to just like speak about this stuff and also have a platform 
where we can celebrate the best of our culture, food and entertainment and music and movies, but not being judged on the micro details. Mm. And so I said, all right, let's start something because that's who I am. You know, I want to start stuff if it doesn't exist. Um, and there was already a festival called GFS that was happening uh, in the month of May. And, and I don't know if your listeners know, maybe you don't know either, but I'll share with you. The, the month of May in, in Ontario is South Asian Heritage Month. Okay. And a lot of us don't know that, right? No. Uh, because the, the national program is Asian Heritage Month. And for some reason, Asian Heritage Month and South Asian Heritage Month both got approved at the same time, but then they couldn't coexist. So then the government said, hey, Ontario will be South Asian Heritage Month and Asian Heritage Month. In Canada, it'll be just Asian Heritage Month. So I'm like, well, we have this month long of South Asian celebration and nothing is happening. So why don't we do a giant F you and create an event where we celebrate the culture without dividing ourselves? So that's how DC Plus was born. We found the most public, public place to either succeed or dramatically fail. So we chose Young Dundas Square and it would right. either have been embarrassing if 10 people showed up in the heart of the city or like what happened, 30,000 people showed up our first year. And as we wrap up our 13th year, over 150,000 people show up. And what we've done in every single show is continue to show people that while we speak different languages, we're from different countries of origin, we dress a little bit differently, we are all the same. And the things that I value in my mixed marriage, you know, healthy kids and good morals and education and, and just good humans is what you do if you're a Punjabi family, a Pakistani family, a Bengali family, a Sri Lankan family. So if a family values align, then why do we come to this country and build silos and roadblocks on the things that don't matter anymore? And that's what they see first stands for. That's awesome. That is so beautiful. That is such a great, and I think it's a very, very important message for every single one out there, uh, whether they're South Asian or not. It's all about uniting us together from a hum human perspective, right? And That's I think it. that is so, so needed in today's world, especially with whatever we are seeing uh, these days with... Uh, yeah. Black Lives Matter and so on and so forth. So well, that's I'm a great so point you brought up, man. Yeah. Because when, when we were looking at back in you know 2006 or seven, one of my biggest fears was uh, if we are not inclusive by design as a culture mm. internally, and we are not confident to share the best and worst of us to the rest of the world, this is how you create racism. And this is how you create stereotypical thinking because the people that are outside looking into our culture, if we don't give them the window and the door to walk in and experience us, then what they see and hear about us becomes their version of it. Mm. And nine out of 10 times is the worst version of us because it's perpetuated by media and Bollywood and movies that it is not true. So we said, man, as soon as we can blow the doors up and open the damn windows and let everybody in, and the sooner they can see how awesome our culture is and our religion is and our food and music and fashion is, they would appreciate us for who we are and not for this statistics of South Asians and minorities. Right. Yeah. That, I'm so glad you have done that. And even despite, um, you know, with the, even with the pandemic, right, even with the pandemic this year, um, you guys were able to run the show. Uh, through digital platforms. How was that experience? How did you guys turn that around? Because a lot of businesses, shows, events, um, for them, um, this uh, the COVID was their kryptonite, right? So how did you yeah, guys o o overcome that? Uh, That's a great question, May, because, you know, tying it back to the previous segment we had on like, you know, why do you do what you do? For yeah. me, the AC Fest, as I explained, was never about the festival. It was never about the audience or the artist, sorry. It was always about the community that showed up. Mm. We used 23 to 30 different artists as a way to attract hundreds of thousands of people from the community where our real purpose was to talk to the community, right? And where we were different than all the other festivals is the festivals that ran were focused on the artists on stage. Mm. Who do we book? Who do we bring in? Who's the headliners? We never cared about that because for me, 
it was 150,000 people in, in, in the stadium that as my audience, those are the people I'm speaking to. Those are the people that are contributing to the growth of this country. Those are the people that are working as, as bus drivers and restaurant owners and you know, financial institutions and VPs and CEOs. They're the ones that are influencing how inclusive we are at their workplaces and things. And so for me, that was the audience. Yeah. So when we said, hey man, live events are not happening, but if our purpose is to, is to continue this conversation with the community, what's the best way to do it? Well, let's go to Facebook and see what happens. And, and, and we started doing live stream shows on April 4th and uh, we hit 180 shows as of this month, uh, wow. over a million organic reach. Um, and what's beautiful is just like Daisy Fest, while the show is happening on Facebook, the real conversations are happening in the comment section. People are talking, they're sharing, they're conversing, they're making friends. We're influencing thought leadership again. We're showing them through the music how really we are all the same. Yeah. It's a great reminder for everybody that we, there, there's so, much, so many commonalities between us, but we, for some reason or the other, we just hold on to those differences and you know divide ourselves so it's a great message yeah. that you're giving out to us to the audience to the world that it's time it's high time that we unite ourselves um in the fabric of humanity right so thank yeah, and, you so and, much and, and what you said is perfect man like i think you know there's this notion of like we need to let go of our differences we need to be blending in and that's not what i'm saying all i'm saying is use the differences to yeah. positively include others right i want to give you the best of me i want to give you the not so best of me yeah. i want i want to, i want you to experience all of it because that's how i'm going to make sure you are full of love and not hate and hate shows up in moments of confusion and when there's no clarity but if i can remove your confusion and if i can give you a clear vision into me and our culture and who we are then there's emptiness which is now fully ready for love Wow. I love that. Satish, tell us where can we learn more about you and your work and feel more inspired by what you do? Thank you, man. Uh, Desi Fest is, is, you know, at DesiFest.ca. You can find us on Facebook. You can, you can hit us up on Instagram. Uh, the work I do is under Ballad Group. Uh, you follow me on Instagram, uh, sats.b. Uh, and, and really, I try to, you know, live a very public life on purpose. You know, I decided at a much early age, that uh, my purpose is mm -hmm. to take my blueprint and my way of thinking and share it with any, as many people who are in my 14 year old version in their lives. Mm -hmm. And that 14 year old version of me is, is probably the worst version for somebody to be in because you're not in control of your own life. And so I've made it my purpose in life to say how many people that are living my version of 14 year old that I can break and how many people can I help get past that hurdle and what would that look like if, if we now get up every single morning fully empowered to figure out what life we want to live and like choose it by design. And so get in touch. If this is the kind of stuff that you're questioning, know that you're not alone. There's people like Omer, there's people like me, there's a hundred other people that are here to help you at least think differently. What yeah. you do with that thought is up to you, but we're here to at least show a different type of blueprint. So get in touch and happy to share. And if there's one thing that you can learn from this episode is definitely reach out, change your environment, take ownership of your, of your life and, uh, you know, reach out to reach, reach out to those people who you think can help you out. Satish, this was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing so many golden nuggets. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure, man. Thank you for having me on the show. That's awesome.